Thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity here, Andreas, to be able to talk a little, about, a little bit about the, um, the constitutional system the, uh, and, and the um, implications through Brexit. Well, from the perspective uh, of an external constitutional legal scholar, ladies and gentlemen, the last few weeks have indeed been equally fascinating and frustrating. Uh, in the last three years since the Brexit referendum, we seem to be witnessing some sort of self-destruction of a political and constitutional system. A self-destruction appearing to be accelerating in speed, more or less on a daily basis since Boris Johnson took office just two months ago. The somewhat foundation of any parliamentary system, that is the government's majority in parliament, is not only cracked but simply non-existent when it comes to Brexit-related questions. Theresa May's deal, agreed upon with the European Union, failed the necessary majority in Parliament three times. Yet instead of being forced out of office by a vote of no confidence initiated by the opposition, she w it was in fact her own party that finally forced her to leave, only to choose Boris Johnson as new Prime Minister by an internal popular vote. That is. Yet Boris Johnson more or less instantly infuriated Parliament by initiating its prorogation, in effect since yesterday, that was not only completely unnecessary, but clearly intended to circumvent parliamentary debate in one of the most crucial moments of recent British history. A conclusion, by the way, we all know the Scottish Court of Appeal just confirmed. However, in a Star Wars-like moment, the alleged sovereign, that is of course Parliament, stroke back instantly and passed a bill forcing government to ask for an extension of the Brexit deadline should there be no deal until the 19th of October. And Boris, well, disappointed and somewhat insulted of this outcome, he excluded 21 MPs from the party hardly only backbenchers, as we know, and even indicated that he might ignore this legal duty by constantly bragging that he about rather lying dead in a ditch than asking for such an extension. Jacob Rees-Mogg, meanwhile, showed what he thought of all this by stretching himself out on the first bench of Parliament, as leader of the House, that is. Now, all in all, fascinating to watch, but more than frustrating and even scaring when realizing that we are not talking of some new series of the House of Cards or Game of Thrones, but of real life and decisions, or rather non-decisions, that will have severe consequences on this and on the other side of the channel. So ladies and gentlemen, what is actually happen happening to the British Constitution? What is going on with the political and parliamentary culture of a nation so proud of its parliamentary history? And how does the Queen fit into all this? Now, in the following about 20 minutes, I would thus like to share just f five somewhat unsystematic external observations of these uh, recent developments, uh, and will here and there also uh, link these to similar developments maybe in other countries. Some of the um, things I will say have already been said, uh, but maybe from another perspective. I will thereby also try to answer whether we only have a problem with the current political elite, or whether the problems actually go deeper, scratching the political system itself. The consequences of the latter would be dramatic, of course. Even good politicians then might not have been able to deliver on Brexit in a satisfying manner. So first, first observation is nothing really new and not even specifically Brexit related. It is, be careful when mixing direct and representative democracy. The referendum in 2016 is of course the reason for the current Brexit mess and I don't want to repeat too much of what has been said in this respect. However, I do want to point to two severe theoretical problems of direct democracy that are now visible also in practice. First, no one can be held responsible in direct democratic procedures. As the people take the decision, no one can be seriously blamed and voted out of office for its consequences. 
It is always the somewhat wise and untouchable sovereign that has spoken. In practice, even criticizing the decision, no matter how stupid it may have been, appears difficult. Now, this is obviously very different in representatives, uh, representative systems. Criticism from the outside is not only common by here, but actually wanted. And in the worst case, we simply vote for another parliament. And this directly leads to a second problem. That is the factual irreversibility of decisions taken in such a referendum. The reversibility of decisions is, of course, a central element of any democratic order. Decisions can and will be reversed as soon as majorities change. Though constitutionally possible, therefore, Parliament could, of course, decide to reverse the decision taken in 2016. From a legal perspective, the referendum was unbinding anyway. However, politically, Parliament will obviously not be able to do so, as this would appear undemocratic. And indeed, it would look somewhat strange if Parliament asked the people only to decide otherwise later. So in case of a re referendum, the only institution that would be able to reverse the decision somewhat legitimately would be the people themselves in a second referendum. But here again, though reversing democratic decisions in case of changed majorities is probably the most democratic decision there is, asking for a second referendum is perceived as being undemocratic for not respecting the sovereign's will as articulated in the first referendum. And this is, of course, also the reason why Boris Johnson today can claim to be protecting democracy when circumventing parliament. According to this narrative, the Prime Minister is, of course, protecting direct democracy against representative democracy. And it's hard to say that he's completely off track here. So in the end, we might end up with a Brexit that at the time it finally occurs is actually rejected by the majority of MPs and maybe even the people only in order to respect a direct democratic decision taken more than three years ago by a people that at the time, as anybody else, had no idea of what it was actually deciding on. In one word, absurd. Now, is this a systemic problem? Well, it shows that one should not mix the two systems, at least when it comes to complex decisions. Representative democracy is indeed superior in these cases for several reasons. But the fault for all this lies entirely with David Cameron, as the system itself might have allowed but clearly not requested such a referendum. Future prime ministers should simply respect these experiences made and stop pretending that direct democracy is of any higher value than representative democracy. Second, functioning frameworks. The last few years have seen significant changes in some legal frameworks that in my view have at least contributed to some of the problems we are seeing in right now. And Ed has actually mentioned most of these. The first one dates back to 2011. Obviously, I'm talking of the Fixed Term Parliament uh, Act. Uh, this act especially changed the competence of government when it comes to calling a snap election, making the sort of zombie government possible we are seeing at the moment. A government with no majority and thus unable to bring anything through parliament, yet unable to call for an election. Yes, such a situation can also occur in other parliamentary systems. However, the political culture in Britain does not seem to have adjusted to this new situation yet. Especially as it is not common for members of the two leading parties to cooperate in order to form new reliable majorities. For instance, supporting the leader of the opposition or anything like that. And as a consequence, we now see a situation similar to that of a presidential system, with the executive and the legislative opposing each other, yet without anyone who might act as a problem solver and no uh, political culture used to such a weird and odd situation in a parliamentary system. A second observation, and this is something also Ed just mentioned, is something that in my view is not restricted to Britain, and that is a problematic development concerning the selection process for party leaders. I believe that we can generally see a growing influence of ordinary party members. You mentioned it for Great Britain. Um, the Conservative Party, of course, elected its leader through its parliamentary members, 
but then switch to this election process we just recently saw for the last time with Boris Johnson. Labour adopted such an election system in 2014, and we see similar apparently democratic developments, of course, in the US since the 70s, where before that the political elite chose their presidential candidate, and it was not the party members, but now also in Germany. AKK, though being elected by a party meeting in the end, was challenged by several other candidates and toured all over Germany before the vote. And the SPD, the Social Democrats, is preparing its popular vote while we are speaking now for the first time. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, because I sincerely believe that neither Donald Trump nor Boris Johnson would be the leader of their party and their country if we still had a system where the elite of the parties had the last word. This might sound less democratic at first. However, a popular vote generally gives an advantage to more populist characters. Why? Well, because no ordinary party member has anything to lose when voting for such tough characters. MPs, when voting for a leader, on the other hand, have an incentive to choose someone who's votable, who is able to compromise, someone who takes interest in the political debates in Parliament and knows how to get decisions through. Jeremy Corbyn, for instance, might be popular, as we've heard, with the Labour base, yet is somewhat, well, disliked by quite a, small, a big fraction of um, the Labour MPs. And there's obviously no good situation when it comes to trying to formulate a consistent opposition policy. And the same is probably true for Boris Johnson. Him getting rid of obnoxious MPs immediately after the no, no, no deal vote um, serves my point uh, here. And in Germany, you, some of you might have heard this, the famous comedian Jan Böhmermann just a few days ago announced that he would like to um, stand as candidate for uh, SPD leader. And his candidacy then, in the end, only failed for formal reasons. But what might have happened if, these, if he had actually become a formal candidate for the leadership of the SPD? Especially considering the fact that the Social Democrats are themselves asking for younger people to join the party until mid of September because they can then participate in the vote. Now that would have been very interesting, I would uh, believe. And of course we see that in presidential systems anyway, just think of the Ukraine and of course uh, the United States. Now I do not really have an answer to uh, this and don't really know what to do. I simply wanted to share my impression that the selection process of the party leader might be of an even greater relevance for the stability of a democracy than we actually thought so far. Three, when looking at the parliamentary debates, especially German scholars were somewhat surprised to see the government's influence on parliamentary procedures. Government does not only decide almost entirely on the parliamentary agenda, but also has the possibility of proroguing parliament, even against its own will. And this is indeed a surprising fact, considering the amount of effort that is always sort of put on the um, expression of sovereignty of parliament when, when talking to British uh, scholars. And this is completely different to the German parliament, for instance, that acts autonomously regarding all internal matters, especially its agenda. Now, such a dependence is obviously no problem in normal times when government has its majority in parliament and so on, but we see how such procedural arrangements unimportant procedural arrangements at first glance, can complicate matters when this fundamental requirement is missed. And in a fragmented society, we heard a lot about that in the last two days, such situations might occur more often in the future. So indeed, we might need some sort of amendment here, not only allowing Parliament as a whole more influence on its own agenda, but possibly also giving the opposition more room to influence parliamentary proceedings. Four, the voting system. The British voting system is, to quote Barney from How I Met Your Mother, somewhat legendary. Now, Alex, you just talked about um, the uh, boundaries uh, changes we, we saw recently. I'm not going to focus on that but rather on the relative majority uh, system, uh, which has led, of course, to a two-party system with Tory and, and, and Labour as being the big parties and alternating prime ministers from each of the two parties and so on. 
In Parliament, the Prime Minister also sits opposite to the single, the single leader of the opposition. And the system has obviously worked for centuries, and changing it all too quickly would hardly appear sensible. Messing with voting systems is never a very good idea, as we see in Germany now, where the messing came from the outside, from the Bundesverfassungsgericht, of course. Um, however, one should note that such a system generally obviously only functions in a society that is more or less divided amongst these two party lines. Uh, you are either Tory or Labour, left or right, and whatever. Uh, as we see in other modern societies, however, the simple differentiation seems to have lost much of its significance. Societies are getting more fragmented. We have more parties, more interest groups, and so on. And most important, we also see a split among the parties, or not only a split, as you just have just shown us, but, but more than that, probably. Brexit, in this sense, has proven that being Tory or Labour does not mean that you are going to agree on most political questions. Now, obviously, this has always been the case, but we have also seen diverging opinions within the parties before. But the difference, of course, is with Brexit that we are talking about a fundamental question here, the most fundamental question in British politics, probably, at the moment. A political system that is founded on the idea of a homogeneous government and a homogeneous opposition is hardly capable of dealing with such a, such a situation. So in the long run, we will need to think of how to mirror this development in the voting system. And that might mean changing from majority to a proportionality voting system, or as a first step, maybe, at least to constituencies where more than one MP is elected. We have such systems, for instance, in Malta or in Ireland. Um, so not, at least not so many votes fall out of the ballot box. Even though the single transferable vote system they have there is, uh, appears to be rather complicated, actually. Um, obviously, in the long run, this might result in a fundamental change of the political system. And I'm, I'm aware of the fact that the big parties, of course, will veto such a change. But that um, does not alter the fact that we are currently seeing a problematic deficit in representation. And no political system will be able to keep up its, le its legitimacy in the long run in such a situation. Ladies and gentlemen, when Boris Johnson asked for the prorogation of Parliament, all eyes were directed at the Queen. Will she step in and ensure the rights of Parliament? Will she prevent Johnson from circumventing Parliament in a time of crisis? Uh, well, we know the answer, uh, no. No, and the media, not only the German media, soon justified this decision with the apparent role the monarchy has grown into in the last 100 years, according to these comments. And we heard that the government obviously believes so uh, too. The monarch is not supposed to interfere with everyday politics, but acts as an unpolitical institution. But is it really true that the monarch has no other than representative functions? Can she actually be completely unpolitical? Where she has formal prerogatives only sort of um, taken together with the government? Well, when comparing the constitutional arrangements to others, we find that, for instance, the German Bundespräsident, though I agree, obviously, not nearly as glamorous as the Queen, um, is not reduced to mere representative functions, but in times of crisis can also act as a problem solver. We saw that, for instance, after the last election, more or less forcing the Social Democrats into a coalition with Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats. And we find similar intervention rights of the Bundespräsident in other times of crisis. Now, the monarch, with all her authority, therefore could at least have tried to interfere and reject the, inter the prog prorogation proposal presented to her by Boris, Johnson, by Boris Johnson. And she could have done so, in my eyes, because it was no matter of everyday politics, but would have ensured parliamentary debate in a time of crisis. No head of state, in my eyes, can actually remain unpolitical when it comes to the foundations of the political system itself. Who else could have taken over such, such a role? A constitu constitutional uh, court, a court? 
We will, of course, have the Supreme Court now deciding, but is that actually a good idea? Well, maybe, yes, but let me also tell you that this might not be the best solution in such a political crisis. And let me also tell you, as a German legal scholar, giving too much competences to a constitutional court can indeed have its shady side on the political process. Just think of the German court's role in the Euro crisis. And we will see how it works out with the Supreme Court uh, that is going to decide now on the prorogation. Um, because from a legal perspective, we have actually no real idea of what such a decision would actually lead to. Um, would that actually mean that the Queen was just overruled by the Supreme Court because it's formally her prorogation, it's not the government, it's the government proposing, but would she then be sort of taken into the political process as a matter of fact immediately? Would it be, would we call the prorogation void, meaning nothing less than sort of declaring a act of the Queen void? Is that actually possible? We don't really know how the Supreme Court is actually going to um, decide in this matter. So, let me come to a conclusion. Is it the political leaders or is it the system? The answer is somewhat typical for a legal scholar. It's probably both. As we learned recently from Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zieblatt, politicians will always matter as they need to comply to a culture of institutional cooperation and forbearance. With the prorogation of parliament and the threat to ignore the law, Boris Johnson has, in my view, clearly breached this necessity. And I do believe that at least the Scottish Courts of Appeal would agree. But the systemic deficiencies of the current unwritten British constitution are hardly insignificant. And this should make us think. Brexit brought these up, yet was not their cause, as Ed just said. To construct a functioning democracy is complex, as the ch chosen system needs to reflect the expectations of society. It therefore needs to offer sufficient participation, sufficient limitations to, on governmental powers, but also sufficient efficiency, always meaning efficient from the perspective of the current society. In my view, we can see that the current system thereby no longer fully reflects the respective expectations as far as participation, and as efficiency is concerned. And that is independent from the people sitting in parliament and the government. That, one might add, are indeed probably making things worse, but it's the system also. It therefore might be time to think, now don't be shocked, about a written constitution, ladies and gentlemen, that tries to address these specific problems. And we heard even a prime minister, Gordon Brown, once thought about such an option. The British Constitution has functioned for hundreds of years, but being old is no argument in itself when it comes to generating the necessary legitimacy. I profoundly disagree with Max Weber at this point. Legitimacy takes place in the present, not in the past. And it's the present expectations that need to be met. Each generation, therefore, requires a constitution matching its ideas of how democracy should work. And this is something the British political system will have to deal with, within or outside the EU. Thank you very much.